begin with the reading from the Acts of the Apostles, in which we are told that the disciples are in the upper room. They are sitting, minding their own business, and suddenly, at the initiative of God, there is a rush of mighty wind, which they all hear, and then there are tongues of fire that anticipate the languages that they are all about to speak. It is a horrible moment. And Peter goes on to explain at the end by quoting the apostle, by quoting the prophet Joel. It is said that in those days, when the day of the Lord comes, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And that verb pour reminds us of our baptisms when we are poured with water and baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and sealed by the Spirit in baptism. And that spirit is poured out on all flesh, Jew and Gentile. And daughters, as well as sons, will prophesy. So there's gender equality on Pentecost. And young men and old men see visions and dream dreams, so there's age equality on the day of Pentecost. And even on the slaves, both men and women, the Holy Spirit comes, there is equality in every way when God moves upon the earth. I'm reading a book called Living Reconciliation currently, and it's a wonderful book, and here's a quote from it. On the day of Pentecost, everyone heard the good news in their own language. No wonder was there one special people with one language who were set apart. God is the God of the whole world with Jew and Gentile, men and women, slave and free. So now, when you were baptized, the Holy Spirit was poured out on you. So how many of you have prophesied recently? Raise your hand if you have prophesied recently. <coughs> And going up, <laughs> except Meredith, the troublemaker. <laughs> so, Meredith, in what ways have you prophesied recently? Telling the good news of Jesus Christ. Well, maybe. <laughs> Let me ask another question. How many of you have recently encouraged or supported someone? How many of you have recently consoled or comforted someone? Well, according to St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 14, 3, that prophecy, you've been prophesying all along. The Spirit is alive in you. You need to know that. Now we move on to our reading from the Gospel. Jesus said to his disciples, when the advocate comes whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. So again, you've all been filled with the Holy Spirit. How many of you have testified recently? Point 
gospel is this one. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. First of all, before I say something about my going away, Here's what William Temple, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury from 1942 to 1944, writes about this passage. He begins by asking a question. What became of the disciples' faith, which relied upon the Lord during his earthly life as an external presence to whom they could turn at every moment of doubt or need? When the crisis came, it all went to pieces. They all left him and fled. Yet a few weeks later, these same disciples are found confronting the rulers of their nation with a calm and unruffled courage. What explains the transformation? Jesus has withdrawn from them as a visible external presence. And now the Spirit is the very breath of their lives. Then Archbishop Temple adds this. In the spiritual life, it is of urgent importance that we remember from whom our strength comes. The Holy Spirit, the giver of life. He is the Spirit of Christ, whom disciples receive through their companionship with Christ. Keeping the Archbishop's words in mind, here's what I'd like to say about my going. First of all, for those of you who don't think it's to your advantage that I go away, there are ways I know it won't be to my advantage either. Peter and I will miss you terribly. And you will miss us. But Sunday by Sunday, we will still have each other. We worship together. We sing together. We learn together even to prophesy and testify together. And we will not. And that will be terribly hard for us. But second, the reason that it is to your advantage that I go away is because you will now have a chance to rediscover what I have known all along throughout my time with you. That all the wonderful things you and I have done together and tried together were the work of the Holy Spirit among us, working through us, and that same Spirit will continue with you and bring you to new and surprising things. So please remember, the Spirit is not coming to us through a pipeline from the past. It comes to us as a wind Third, listen to St. John's version of the giving of the Spirit. When it was evening on that Easter day, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And then he empowered them with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Listen once again to living reconciliation and what the authors say about being sent. The Eucharistic liturgy is a challenge as well as a blessing. We can focus so much on inviting people in to the church that we forget that the direction of the liturgy is sending people out. At the 11 o'clock service, we will baptize my granddaughter, Courtney. And at this service as well, we will reaffirm our baptismal vows. And when that moment happens, we will pray for Courtney, and we will soon at this service pray for ourselves, and one of the prayers that we will pray is this. 
change our vocabulary. If it's true that 27 years ago Jesus sent me and me with and Karen and Jane to send Gregory to stay witness to his love, then I'm not really entirely, but Jesus is sending me Or are.